Good morning, everybody. Glad to see everybody here today. Uh, of course, it's Communion Sunday, and we have our meal afterwards, so everybody please come down. Whenever Ed and Dorothy arrive, fried chicken should be with them. Uh, October 17th, that's a Monday evening, Diaconate will be at 6.30 p.m. October 18th is food delivery. October 19th, the next day is food distribution. Then October 27th is another food delivery. Now, um, I had Tim order food, and Gary and Ken and I went up, Ken drove, we went up to Lorraine uh, to Second Harvest on Friday. And we got a pretty, we got 200 pounds of meat, so I'm going to have Tim do the same thing for this Friday. Ken said he's available. So, this Friday, yeah. So, I'll try to... Uh, get Tim to get another load in pretty much like we got because the canned goods are sure are helping and everything so we'll just and some of that stuff is free so um, we'll just go with that so we'll uh, go ahead with Wanda How's everybody doing today? Very good, thank you. What a beautiful I did. What a beautiful day that the Lord has made. Amen to that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Let's please stand and let's do, recite the Lord's Prayer at this time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's please do the next two songs.
time we'll do a prayer request. Is there any prayer concerns today? Go ahead, Bonnie. It's the calling hours of funeral that you're going to today. Some of you are going to. Okay, we definitely want to keep Pastor Tim in prayer. I yeah, feel bad for him. Uh, certainly, everybody misses him. And. Uh, David, you had a prayer concern? Go ahead. Okay, most definitely. Wow. 
Okay. Is there any other prayer concerns at this time? Oh, go ahead. Is there any other prayer concerns? Okay, let's bow our heads. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence, for your love and your grace, your mercy. We thank you, Father, how you hear our prayers and how you meet our needs. And Lord, we lift up these prayer requests today. And of the Bob Winkenship family with the loss of his wife had passed, we just pray for that family. It was mentioned that it was a shock. We pray for your comfort upon them, that they would sense your presence, and that they would realize tomorrow will be a day of encouragement because of the resurrection. And Father, we lift up Pastor Tim uh, with these kidney stones, and we just pray that he'd, they'd pass, that he'd get the treatment that he needs, whatever needs to happen. We pray, Father, for a restoration of his health. And uh, we pray for Linda that fell and cracked her hip and is in a nursing home. We pray for a speedy recovery and, uh, and that she get back home soon. We think of the devastation this Hurricane Ian had done in Florida and other areas, and we just ask for that the communities to come together, that those who are trapped would be found, that there, there would be unity, and they would sense your presence there. We know that we've heard that Samaritan's Purse is there, and we ask that this would be an opportunity for the gospel to be at work at the time of their greatest need, and they'd come to you, Father, and realize that through you is all hope. And we lift up Ed's nephew, Dusty. We're sorry to hear uh, about his heart condition, heart failure. We just pray that you would heal his heart in this condition. If not, that you would guide the doctors to the proper treatment to give him stability and of health and life, Father. And and that you would just be with him and help him to come to you at this time and to put everything on you, Father, to trust in you, Lord. And, Father, as we get ready to preach your word here, help us to understand and to realize that not everybody's receptive to you, Father, just as they weren't in Jesus' time, they aren't today. But guide us to be a light and help, our, help us to go where there's darkness. The people, when they see us, they would see you that you would be glorified, Father. And we ask all this, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Today's sermon, I've titled it, The Bread of Life, Not for Everyone. And, uh, and I got to think about it because it does, Jesus talks about communion here in a, in a way when he talks about his blood, his body, his shed blood. But I got to think about, well, how fitting for Communion Sunday. But as we get into the scriptures today, we will be looking at John chapter 6 here shortly. But let me ask you something. If you ever tried to explain something to somebody and they just didn't want to listen to what you had to say? And uh, did you get upset? Or if you told them, hey, uh, maybe some of you uh, had to train people at the workplace. And you say, hey, uh, you need to do something this way. And if you don't, we're going to have a problem. It's going to create problems. You could damage equipment. And they don't listen to you. And they wreck a piece of equipment. And you say, why didn't you listen to me? And I, I got thinking today, how about if you ever try to witness to somebody and they say, well, I don't want to hear it. I don't, want, I don't want to hear what you have to say about Jesus. It's not for me. No, I don't got time for that. Have you ever had that? Sometimes it gets discouraging. But today we're going to look at when Jesus witnesses to the crowd. They rejected him then, and it, that rejection, unfortunately, still goes on today. I'd like to set the background for where, 
where I get started preaching. I will be starting in verse 35 in uh, John chapter 6. But before that, Jesus feeds the 5,000. He crosses a boat across the Sea of Galilee. He goes up on top of the mountain. He sees 5,000 following him. In, a, in the Bible, when they give a number of people, it's usually men that's counted. They didn't count women and children. So think of it as nearly 15,000 people following Jesus up on the side of the mountain. And as he's going up that mountain, he sees them. He takes pity upon them. He turns to Philip. And he goes, uh, you know, where can we buy food for these people? And Philip says to him, well, Lord, 200 denali wouldn't even be enough to give them a little. And then, his, then Simon Peter's brother Andrew comes to him and says, uh, Lord, uh, there's a lad here that has uh, five barley loaves and two fish. And I didn't realize it until I got looking into Scripture a little more. Barley loaves were a symbol, a representation of someone with a lower income. So that poor people ate barley loaves. Those who were well off had wheat, ate wheat bread. And the fish at that time, they weren't like they were fresh caught. They were dried or pickled. I don't know about anybody here. I've never seen pickled fish. But, but anyhow, Jesus tells, him, tells the apostles, have everyone sit down. And he himself sat down, and he gives thanks uh, over the bread and over the fish, and they distribute it. As you know, that everyone got plenty to eat, and there was 12 baskets left over. I got a question. How many of you here, you know, some of you brought food in today, which is great, and it's your gatherings. Have you ever brought food in and went home with more than what you brought in? If you baked a pie and you brought one pie in and you come home with 12? Has anybody ever done that? Because we're going to see here in a little bit, uh, just kind of thinking that in mind. Uh, I know you, when we go to a gathering, my wife and I, well, sometimes there's a little bit left over, sometimes there's none left over, which is fine. But to receive more than what you brought. And I'm just uh, thinking about that because Jesus, after this, the apostles leave and they go to Capernaum. And he, this is when he walks on water, he gets in a boat with them and they take off. And all these people there are wondering where Jesus got to. And so the next day they find him and, and they said, uh, they find Jesus and they say to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered them, truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because of the signs, because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Jesus calls them out for caring more about getting a belly full than actually the signs that was performed in front of him. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week? Remember uh, Isaac? And Esau, and he wanted, uh, and Isaac's going to bless his son Esau because of the food that he made, because he liked the wild game. Go ahead and make me that dish, and I'm going to bless you when you come in. And, uh, and I got thinking about this, and uh, when I first started dating my lovely wife back there, her parents were very nice, and most, two of the kindest, most wonderful people I've ever known in my entire life. And I, and I started attending the church the same church that my wife was at and where we're at now. And, but her mom would always say, hey, Jeff, why don't you come up after church and have dinner with us? You know, and I always come up with an excuse. Well, you know, she was being nice. She's trying to get to know me better, and she was always reaching out to me. And I kept telling her, no, I got stuff to do at home on the farm. My dad wants me to mow hay or rake hay or bale hay or do something. I got cows to feed. Don't we always have something to do? So one day I decided to, I said, you know, I can't keep doing this. It's wrong. It's rude. It's not being kind. So I decided to go up there. And uh, she had the best pork chops I ever had in my life. <laughs> Let me tell you that. I have never had pork chops on the bone, just nice and tender. They fall off of mashed potatoes and gravy, homemade. I mean, it was, guess what? I was there every Sunday after that. <laughs> so food does a lot. And, and it, boy, don't know how food shape your direction, make your decision there. And, and, uh, and so we see that they were following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. And he tells them that he wants to give them the food that 
past for eternity to give him eternal life. And he's pointing to himself as the essence of the as the essence of eternal life. And he asked Jesus, Well, what what can we do to perform the works of God? And I found that interesting. What can we do to perform the works of God? Has anybody ever asked you, yeah, what can you do to perform the works of God? And Jesus replied, He says, that you believe in the one he has sent. So when we believe in Christ, we are actually doing the work of God. And we are to have faith, and through faith we are saved by grace. Our faith is a gift from God. I know last week I mentioned on some unanswered prayers, and sometimes we struggle surrendering it. One thing it's always good to do is to ask for more faith. There's nothing wrong with that, because faith is from God. And so then, as I mentioned earlier, they asked for Jesus for a sign. And I'm like, well, what did they do with the 12 baskets that were left over? You know, you got fed yesterday, and now you had 12 baskets left over. I mean, I'm, wouldn't you think that would hit home? And I, and, I, and I struggled with it. Well, today we're going to start in John 35, verses 35 through 40. I want to read, start reading there. And, uh, and then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my, father, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. See, this passage reveals to us the stages of Christian life. We see Jesus in the New Testament scriptures and even in the teaching of the church. And having seen Jesus, we come to him. And we see him as someone who is approachable and accessible. And then we believe in him. And this belief is a total surrender of our lives, as we talked last week. Submission. And we become a new creation in Christ. And none of us can come to Christ unless the Father calls us. Isn't that an amazing and wonderful thing? But as we talked last week, isn't submission the hardest thing to do? And let me, you know, I was thinking back, can you think back when you were a teenager? Didn't you think your parents knew nothing? I was amazed at how much my mom and dad did not know, for as old as they were. Let me tell you that. I, I, I was there. And, uh, and by the time I hit my 20s and by the time I was 30, even in my 50s, I realized how much I don't know. No searching of the human mind and heart can fully find God unless it's through Jesus. A great commentator once said, Christ brings us to the haven beyond which there's no danger. You know, and I find it interesting, now the Jews start complaining and ask themselves, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, the carpenter, whose parents we know? How can he say he came down from heaven? And they didn't recognize the virgin birth. They forgot about it. See, they thought they knew who he was, and therefore, how can he say he's the son of God? They started judging him. And they were looking at his outward appearance and not seeing him for who he really was. They were seeing him as a mere carpenter's son who performed a few miracles. I got a question I'd like to ask. Is there ever a time when you judge somebody and you were totally wrong? You got this opinion of them, and then when you really got to know them, they were something different? And I got a confession here. I, and I got to tell this one person where I work, I, I've done that. I, uh, I, I said it on an interview, and I thought, you know, I'm not sure if this person's going to be a good fit. You know, personality, I, I was worried about, you know, conflicts of personality. You think, oh, boy, if I'm working with somebody every day, and if, especially if we don't get along, it's not making going to work very pleasant. But I was totally wrong with this man. He does whatever I ask him to do. I, if I tell him, hey, I'm going to go over here, and I'm just going to be doing this, putting a plate in a, a control box and wiring up a transmitter. So uh, that's where I'm at if you need me. 
I'll turn around. I'll have my plate in there. I'll turn around. He's standing right there next to me. What can I do to help you? You know, he's been very gracious and kind. And, uh, and while I was doing re researching this, I come up with a story about someone misjudging someone else. And, uh, does anybody know the name Thomas Edward Lawrence? You might have heard the name T.E. Lawrence. I didn't know the name either, so don't feel bad. Uh, and he was a British archaeologist. He was an army officer, a diplomat, and a writer. And he became known, known for being in different battles. He served in, like, in World War I. Well, he had a friend of his whose name was Thomas Hardy, who was a novelist and a poet, you know, over in England. He was, and uh, Lawrence would go over and visit him all the time, visit Hardy and his wife. And, well, one day, this mayoress of Dorchester was there. And she was either the mayor of the town or married to the mayor, was there. And she was kind of like high society, but she didn't know who Lawrence really was. You know, because when he showed up, he just showed up in his regular aircraft uniform. He was actually a colonel, but he didn't dress lavish. He just showed up and he looked at him as being somebody ordinary. And so, as she sat in there, she sat down and, uh, and she said to Hardy's wife, and she spoke in French because she didn't think uh, Lawrence would understand French. And she says, uh, never in all her born days had she set, had to sit down to a tea with a private s soldier. She was insulted. And then Lawrence spoke to her in perfect French and said, uh, I beg your pardon, madam. Uh, can I be any use of as an interpreter? Because Mrs. Hardy doesn't know French. And uh, she made a, a shattering mistake kind of judging Lawrence uh, for who he was, who she thought he was. And Lawrence is, uh, you, you might know the movie Lawrence of Arabia. His writings of war and being in battles, this is where that movie came from. You know, and it's the same thing. I remember, you know, we look at books. And you, don't you ever pick up a book and you think you don't like what's inside of it? That's not going to be a good read. It don't look appealing. My wife at one time had this book that her cousin gave her. It's called Rewired. True story. It's about an artificial arm uh, that this woman got put on. But once I, she kept after me to read, and I said, I don't got time. It don't look interesting. I, and once I opened the cover, I found out it was so, I couldn't put it down. But that's what, I misjudged it. And these Jews this time were misjudging Jesus. They thought they knew him when they actually didn't. And, I'd like to wrap up my scripture and reading. I'd like to turn to John 47 through uh, 59, still in chapter 6. And I just find it interesting. Uh, Jesus, you're going to see a repetition of bread in here, how many times Jesus talks to them. And he says, I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But there is a bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is a real food, and my blood is a real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the forefathers ate. Uh, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate the manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And he said this while teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. Why do you think he said he had to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood? You know, when I first read that, I thought he's wanting to drive them away. He knew they weren't there for the right reasons. 
He said that from the get-go. So why would he say? Is he trying to drive them away? But in all reality, at that time, they were used to pagan worship where they would sacrifice an animal on the altar, but part of what was remained left, uh, the priest and those who were there were worshiping it, and they would get to eat of that. And he was saying, you have to really understand me and want me as bad as you want that in order to have eternal life. He wasn't saying physically eat me and drink of my blood, but he was saying is the way you partake of that and how you're into that is what you got to be in my relationship with me. And it is difficult to understand because you're thinking, how gross is this? And I used to think that. Why would he even say such a thing? But he kept reiterating blood, the blood and the bread over and over this. And I was looking at some of these verses here from verse 31 through 59. He reiterates the word bread 14 times. He's saying, you need to have a relationship with me. I am more important than this sacrifice that you're doing, that you go to. And because he thought that they would uh, connect better is why he used what we might think is gross today. It's a difficult thing, but he tried very hard to get them to understand. I used to think he wanted to drive them away, but that was not the case. He told them over and over and over again. Unfortunately, they, many of them desert Jesus after this. It says many of his followers left. And even the apostles said, this is difficult to take. And Jesus says, well, do you want to leave? And he goes, where are we going to go? We know you're the Holy One of God. They understood it more than the rest. But isn't it difficult? Do you, he had to be saddened when he saw those walk away. Because he knew what their fate was going to come to him someday. In the blood there's life, or the life force. And Jesus is saying, you must take my life into the very core of your heart. We have to leave and uh, breathe, live and breathe Christ in order to have salvation. William Barkerley gave a wonderful example of, of this in his text, saying, Christ is like, like we talk, is like a book sitting on a shelf. It is external to you, but once you open it and you read it, it now comes inside you, and it's inside your mind and your heart. From the very beginning, as I mentioned, these individuals were not, these Jews were not looking for eternal life. They were looking for their physical satisfaction. They were wanting to be fed physical food, not spiritual nourishment. They did not want an eternal relationship with Jesus. You know, I mentioned earlier when we tried to witness to others and they tell you I don't want to hear it let's change the subject I feel that t today the church is facing the same thing as Jesus did back then there's a great turning away they didn't want him then they don't want him now I've talked to several pastors and they talked about the congregations that they had before COVID and after COVID how they're much smaller and, and I think about that in Sometimes I think, you know, there's a separation there and that those who were there before COVID, maybe Jesus wasn't their number one priority. I hope I'm wrong with that. He was concerned with their wanting a real relationship with them, and that's why he kept using his broken body and blood, shed blood for the remission of sins. I am convinced that Jesus explained the gospel the best that he could, as I mentioned earlier. He knew that the majority would reject it. But unfortunately, that rejection is still going on today. We shouldn't be offended when somebody uh, rejects us when we witness to them. I oftentimes like to cite uh, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. I used to do a challenge with our youth group. I'd say, all right, somebody's dying. You've got 60 seconds to talk to them about Christ. What would you say? And they would look at me, well, don't put this on me right now, Jeff. And, uh, or they do the fun thing you may have never heard of, the nose goes, where they touch their nose. So his last one touched the nose. Hey, you got to go first. Never heard that. I didn't know it either until I got in my teens. I taught the youth group here for some years. I'm still doing it. I think I was the one that got taught. But when I witnessed to somebody, I was witnessing 
one man one day, and I says, uh, I said, for in the Bible it says, if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And he looked at me, and he goes, Jeff, it's not that simple. I says, why are you making it harder than what it already is? We don't need to do that. We keep it simple. And I always have, I like to cite scripture when I'm witnessing to people. Here it is. It's our job to feed others. What they do with that food is up to them. So don't be discouraged in this, in our times of struggle with the church. Be encouraged because Jesus dealt with the same things that we're faced with today as the church. Let's just remain faithful in our calling. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the example of hearing John that was recorded. As we struggle today in ministry, as Jesus struggled then, they rejected him then, they reject you today. We just pray, Father, we would continue to be a light in a dark world, that when others see us, they see you, that we would be your witness to this generation and beyond. And we ask all this, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.